MBX is a uh, is a library for computer vision, uh, and the uh, sort of the main goal of this library is to be able to be performance portable across a very wide range of, uh, of compute architectures. So uh, we have uh, in this uh, sort of lower left corner uh, graph here, you have lots of different alternatives for hardware to run on uh, where there's different trade-offs between uh, the uh, efficiency uh, and the flexibility of the hardware from uh, very flexible uh, CPUs up through dedicated hardware that does a specific function. Uh, and we want to be able to run on all of these, write, write portable code that runs on all of these and runs on all of them efficiently. And so what we mean by that is that uh, if you, you write your open VX code uh, using the library, then you want to be able to get the same performance or similar performance that you would get uh, if you actually wrote non-portable, hand-optimized code for that specific platform. Um, and so uh, we have uh, created this library and, and actually largely succeeded in this, this goal in that if you look in the upper right of this, uh, this chart, you'll see that uh, there are existing shipping implementations that in fact uh, are representing all of the, the kinds of hardware that are in the chart there. So we have CPUs, GPUs, DSPs, and dedicated hardware represented in shipping impl implementations today. So uh, how do we do that? So the main uh, technique that we're using for this is the idea of a, a computational graph. Uh, so that when you, you invoke the functions in the OpenVX library, you, you don't immediately call them. You know, you, when you call them, you don't invoke them and run them one at a time. You actually uh, put your functions into a graph. Uh, and so, so you don't execute them right away. You build up a graph that describes your entire computation and then uh, that provides the OpenVX implementation an opportunity to do a, a compile or optimization step that actually accounts for not just the, the individual kernels, but the data movement between kernels. Uh, and you're able to do uh, quite a number of, of optimizations that way. And so briefly, uh, a few of the optimizations you're able to do. Uh, one is uh, graph scheduling. So if you have uh, an SOC that has multiple uh, processing units on it, and you want to distribute your computation across uh, these different computation units. This can done, be done automatically uh, by the OpenVX implementation because it knows uh, what compute, compute resources are available and what, uh, what performances they have, what they're, what they're good at and what they're not so good at. So it can do this automatically. Uh, another thing you can do is memory management. So um, if you just do individual uh, computations or individual uh, kernels, you may end up uh, sort of allocating and deallocating a lot or, or doing some hand memory management uh, where you're allocating uh, a lot of stuff or you're reusing uh, memory locations. Whereas if you do this with the uh, OpenVX, it can automatically manage the memory because it knows uh, you know, everything that it's going to need throughout the computation and it can therefore optimize uh, a lot of that uh, memory away and re reuse it. Uh, another technique is, is kernel fusion. So you can have, uh, if you have a, a, a group of kernels uh, that are in a graph that may be common, uh, commonly used, you can replace that with a, an optimized kernel that is, in fact, uh, that does all of those kernels in one. Uh, and you can save a lot on your uh, computation memory bandwidth that way. And finally, uh, uh, an important technique is data tiling. So. All of your uh, modern computer architectures have a memory hierarchy where there's uh, larger, slower memories uh, that are available that you could put entire images, multiple large images in, and smaller local memories that are much faster that maybe won't fit an entire image, uh, but you can compute out of them much more quickly and, and uh, with lower power. Uh, and so what you can do is you can, instead of uh, uh, running your algorithm over the entire image where you run each kernel over the entire image, uh, that, that has pretty bad cache performance. Uh, what you can do is tile the image so that you do a piece of the image and you do multiple uh, operations on that piece of the image uh, and, and you do that over and over. So you do more compute uh, per uh, bringing it into the, the local memory. And so by, that, by doing that, you minimize the overhead of that, that access to the slower memory. Yeah. Yeah. 
So thanks, uh, uh, thanks, uh, Nicholas. So actually, um, let, let me repeat that a little bit, and 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 also emphasize that there's these mic stands, uh, and we're recording the, this. So uh, and and if you're not talking to a mic, they can't hear you. <laughs> so so for questions and comments like that, please come to the mic stands, and, and I'll just repeat. So so when I, I I was saying as I walked through the slide, you, <laughs> you, and and what I by you I meant the implementer of OpenVX, the, not not the application developer. So, so the application developer just builds a graph, and then all of this optimizations that we're describing here are happening automatically, uh, and they're implemented by the vendor who, who implements OpenVX, not the application program. Uh, so, so that's the basics of OpenVX. Uh, there are some extensions that are worth pointing out. Um, so one is a, a neural network extension. So, so uh, most of the, the uh, functions in OpenVX are sort of uh, image processing and, and in traditional computer vision. But there is also an extension for a lot of uh, functions for uh, neural network layers, common neural network layers that can be embedded in your OpenVX graph. Um, there's another uh, extension for classification where this is more traditional classification where you have uh, feature detectors and then some kind of, say, cla cascade classifier that you may still want to use if you have uh, a very limited uh, uh, compute power uh, and a limited number of things that you're trying to, uh, to, to recognize and, and, and you don't want to pay uh, for an entire neural network. Uh, you, you, you have that capability with this extension. Um, there's also a pipelining extension, and this is really important if you have multiple pieces of hardware, uh, multiple processors. Uh, if you uh, if you have um, a multiple processors, you may want to you, your graph may be spread across these multiple processors. There's there, uh, and, and you want to be able to. Uh, insert, if you, and if you have a stream of images, you want to start an image and, and get the, the processing going on that. And before the processing is finished on that first image, you want to start the processing on a second image because you have, you have enough hardware to do that. So it's basic uh, pipelining. Uh, so, so this extension allows you, instead of waiting for the entire graph to, to execute before starting the next image, you just shove images in the front of the graph uh, and it's pipelined through and they, they come out with the usual sort of pipeline delay. Uh, there's also an OpenCL extension, so that if you want to do uh, uh, basically write OpenCL code for some part of your algorithm uh, that may not be covered by the standard OpenVX functionality, uh, there's an interface for doing that with this extension. Uh, there's also an import-export extension, and this is uh, where the idea is you're importing and exporting a compiled graph. So, so you build up the graph using the API as the application developer, and then uh, you call uh, a, a, a basically the compiler. You say verify the graph, and it does that, that compile optimization step. Um, now, you may not, not want to do that compile optimization step every time you run, the, <laughs> run the, your program, right? So, so you want to you compile it once and save that as a binary executable that you can then load in later. And that's what this, this import-export allows you to do. You export a, a compiled, optimized binary, uh, and you import it back in at runtime. So you don't have to do that, that optimization step every time. Finally, there's an import kernel uh, optimiz or, uh, extension, uh, import kernel extension, that allows, uh, well, a vendor of an OpenVX implementation to provide any functionality at all uh, as uh, that may not be covered by the, the uh, um, uh, given uh, standard nodes, uh, or a third-party vendor can provide this. Uh, and so you can import that kernel and then use it in your OpenVX graph like you could anything else. And one thing you could do in one of these imported kernels, you could actually have that be an entire neural network. And that's one of the use cases that we're actually uh, supporting and, and will be uh, uh, expanding on in the next version of OpenVX, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, so um, just in summary here, uh, we've, we've uh, basically achieved the goal of being able to run uh, portable uh, um, portably and with performance and efficiently across this wide range of platforms. Um, if you, uh, uh, I, I gave a, a talk uh, actually yesterday where I actually showed several case studies. Uh, so I'd encourage you, if you want to see some examples of where we're getting this, this portable performance, uh, I, I encourage you to look at that uh, um, video when it comes out, uh, when the EVI folks uh, talk about it. But here today, we're going to uh, dive deep on a particular uh, uh, case study with uh, with access, so we're, we're going to show that in a minute. Um, 
Just a couple of slides on roadmap and, and some resources for OpenVX. Uh, first of all, the, the currently uh, the currently available version of OpenVX is 1.2. Uh, 1.3 uh, spec is, is basically complete. It's in the review and finalization and approval process. Uh, we expect that to be done uh, here at the, uh, the end of June and, and made available uh, publicly in July. Uh, some of the main features of that, uh, one is enhanced neural network support so that you can, as I was talking about earlier, you do this kernel import. You can import an entire description of a neural network. Uh, and we're, we're uh, focusing right now on the NNEF format uh, for describing neural networks, which you'll uh, hear more about this afternoon. Uh, but you can import a neural network, uh, and there will be conformance tests that say you imported that, and then you execute that neural network correctly. Uh, and so there's that uh, um, neural network uh, feature set or me, that neural net functionality coming in with the next uh, next uh, release. There's also this idea of feature sets that actually Neil talked about in terms of OpenCL. Uh, there's actually now quite a bit of functionality in, in OpenVX and not all vendors necessarily need all of that functionality for every application. So we've defined some subsets of the OpenVX functionality that enable a vendor to say, I'm just going to implement the, this sort of coherent, useful subset of uh, the OpenVX standard uh, and offer that to my customers and I, I, I can uh, uh, get conformance tested and certified for that. And so uh, this is main ones are sort of the traditional computer vision uh, kind of things that we, we have in, in OpenVX and, and an alternative is the neural network uh, based where you basically import a neural network and maybe you'll do a little uh, pre and post processing but it's f focused on neural networks. So that's the main division um, and of course your vendor can, can, can supply both. Um, there's also a, a new uh, binary image feature so if you're doing uh, in, a, in a very uh, uh, um, compute constrained environment where you're, you're working with binary masks which, which often happens say in a, uh, uh, a security camera application, uh, if you actually work with binary images uh, instead of uh, you know, 8 bits that are either 0 or 255, uh, you can do a lot, uh, you can be a lot more efficient. So we've got an extension for that. And finally, another big thing in, in OpenVX 1.3 is that, uh, well, in OpenVX 1.2, there's actually a separate spec for safety critical where uh, we actually added some features to that spec uh, alongside the, the regular spec. Those features are going to be merged into 1.3 spec, so there's really just one spec that has safety critical features instead of it being a separate spec. Uh, and the main, uh, one of the main things is, is um, that each individual uh, uh, requirement that is in the spec is tagged uh, so that in your automotive safety critical development process uh, you can track all of those requirements and make sure that they're implemented and tested and verified etc uh, and and you have that that assisting you in the spec all right so that's openbx 1.3 uh, another thing uh, to mention here is that there's a, a open source project that's uh, in development right now uh, on Raspberry Pi. So the, uh, the Raspberry Pi is going to be, it's optimized for the app Raspberry Pi. Uh, there's a company, uh, MultiCoreWare, that is, uh, is working on that right now. Mostly it will be done using the ARM Neon. Uh, so, so there's an ARM core, actually a quad core ARM uh, on the Raspberry Pi device. Uh, and so ARM Neon and the ARM Compute Library is going to be leveraged to accelerate that uh, uh, implementation. There's also a GPU on, on that, uh, and there's this implementation. We talked about this a little bit earlier. I did find an add to this slide. Uh, the pointer to this uh, VC4CL uh, is the implementation that uh, we're working with uh, to implement some of the uh, OpenVX functions on the GPU. Uh, and there's, uh, there's a blog post on this with somebody who's, who's actually uh, gotten this to work, and the, the target date for, for release of that is in September. Uh, and uh, here's some OpenVX uh, resources. Uh, now, you're, you're going to get all of these slides. They'll be posted uh, tonight or tomorrow on the Cronus website. Uh, but uh, uh, one of the places to look is, is uh, just the overview page. Uh, and there's uh, all the specs for both OpenVX and NNEF uh, available at the Cronus website. Um, and there's a lot of other materials like uh, um, tutorials and reference guides and things available online. Uh, and there's a plug for the workshop, which uh, you know about because you're here. <laughs> so. All right. Uh, any questions on OpenVX before we move into the uh, the case study stuff? Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, if you could come up to the microphone, please. So you had mentioned uh, using a CNN as a single node in the graph. Are there any scenarios where it might be more um, efficient or better to break up a CNN into multiple nodes in the graph? Yeah, and so there's there's uh, multiple ways to do that. One is that there's uh, a uh, this extension I talked about before where there's individual layers that are available as nodes in OpenPX. So those can be distributed throughout your graph. Uh, another way to do that would be, um, well, so, so you can import, you, you break your, your network into various pieces, whichever ones uh, you know, make sense to you, uh, and then you can import those separately as separate nodes and then connect them up in an OpenBX graph. So you're completely flexible in that way, yeah. Any other questions? All right, uh, well, thank you, and uh, I'm going to like to introduce um, uh, the Access team. Uh, Nicholas and Mikhail will give a, a presentation on what they're doing with OpenBX. <coughs> Okay, so uh, while uh, Mikael here is uh, preparing the image, uh, just like to introduce us. Uh, so we're from Axis Communi 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 Communications, uh, and it's a computer. Uh, it's a camera surveillance company that uh, is uh, we're making security cameras and so. On. And uh, yeah, <clears throat> so uh, it's a global company. We have uh, more than three thousand mm -hmm. people. Let's see. Where do you press it? Here. There. So, uh, <coughs> and uh, we're currently part of the Canon group, so which means that Canon uh, bought us for some time back, uh, but uh, we're still acting as a sort of a, a pretty much I independent company. So uh, we sell our stuff as Axis, under the Axis label still. Um, what else to say? We're, we have been around uh, for quite some time. We were founded in 1984, actually. At that time, we didn't do uh, cameras. We were doing uh, print servers. So, uh, but uh, we have uh, <coughs> we've always worked with the IP technology. So the, the thing is IP surveillance cameras that can be connected over, over the networks. And uh <coughs> so for this talk uh, um, and this demo that we're going to do, well, Axis does a lot of things, a lot of different uh, whole portfolio of products, but uh, we're going to focus on the video surveillance solutions and in particular analytics uh, applications that can run on cameras. And uh, for that part, we have been working, <coughs> we have been uh, developing algorithms uh, using uh, OpenVX uh, for quite some time. We're involved in the standard standardization work as well. And uh, so <coughs> uh, why OpenVX? Well, uh, we have the need to accelerate things on our uh, <coughs> platforms, and uh, we're develop for, for instance, we're, we are developing an, uh, our own chips. We have the ArtPic chips, that we call them, uh, and we uh, uh, have uh, accelerators in there that we want to have uh, uh, useful APIs for, so that we can uh, get the code to be, above all, uh, portable to other platforms that might have the OpenVX uh, implementation as well, but uh, also accelerated at the same time. And uh, since Axis uh, uses many different chip solutions, we make our own chip, but we also use other chips uh, as well in the portfolio. So we need to have the standardization is really a must for portability for us. So, uh, and, uh, <coughs> so the thing here is that, uh, b before I get into the details, so, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, our experiences from working with uh, OpenVX and algorithm development and uh, uh, our, uh, what we learn in term terms of performance and such. But we're also going to talk about uh, a tool that we developed internally at Axis. It's a kind of graphical tool that will make uh, OpenVX uh, development simpler than just uh, having to do hand code everything in, in directly into C. And uh, we have recently decided that we, we want to offer this tool to the community. So we have just uh, open sourced this tool. And uh, you will be able to find a link to that at the end of the presentation. So, and um, <coughs> to start with uh, OpenVX, and here, here's a typical example from uh, the standard, uh, a standard graph that uh, they're using as a first example. So uh, this is what the graphs actually looks like when you draw them. You're, you're supposed to start from the top here. This is an input image. 
Images are usually drawn as boxes. Uh, computations are, are drawn as circles. And there's uh, some text inside that say what they do. So we have an input image. Uh, in this example, you do some Luma extract. You get an output image that you connect to a blur node. You get another output image. You connect it to a gradient calculation. So this is just a, someone decided and they want to do this uh, chain of operations. So this is just an example then. And then you get the gradients. You can do something magnitude and phase and so on. At the end, you get an output. So you have chained together all those operations because you know that you want to do them to all together. And uh, then you can make this uh, optimized, like Frank said, uh, under the hood. The compiler, uh, runtime compiler can uh, optimize this for your hardware and maybe fuse kernels and do all sorts of things. So. Uh, and now when you, when you look at what it looks like in terms of code, this is the C code that you need to, to uh, set up this graph and to uh, r verify it and then to run it. So it's, a, yeah, it's kind of handleable. I'm not going to go into the, the details of it. It's just the amount of code is reasonable. So you have set up code to just connect all those uh, nodes with each other the correct way and so on. Set some properties. The thing is that <coughs> when we started to work with uh, our motion uh, detection and tracking types of algorithms, uh, we realized that this graph is much smaller than what we typically would like to use. So this is a more realistic example. This is just one of many graphs out of, uh, that we actually use. So you can see there, immediately see there's quite a lot more nodes. We also work, it's uh, different uh, image scales that are pieced together and so on. So the setup code becomes more, something more like this. <laughs> and, uh, I think 80% of this code is uh, just connecting the nodes by using pointers that you need to name in clever ways to, to keep track of them, and uh, you need to connect them to the right uh, input to the to the next object, and so on. Uh, it's really, <coughs> sorry, it's really uh, perfect to make mistakes, <laughs> and it's perfect to make silly mistakes that really has doesn't really have much to do with the application development itself. It's just a setup code that's messy to get right. So, uh, and it's, it's well defined by the standard what it should be. So it's really not something, essentially this is not something you would like to do by hand at all. So what could you do instead? Well, uh, <coughs> typically when you develop those uh, algorithms and when you're reasoning about what you want to do, we ended up doing sketches. We draw those graphs by hand on paper. So we thought, why not try to draw them in a a graph editing program instead. And uh, once you're done drawing them, you add a little bit of me metadata that specifies exactly how you want to, the, the nodes to be initialized and so on. And uh, you can enter that into the nodes in the program as well. And then you just uh, auto-generate the code because the stand <coughs> once you have drawn the graph and set up the parameters, the standard will tell you how exactly the code should look like. So uh, you save this in some XML format, and we created a parser that can parse this XML format and generate the code for it. And uh, it follows certain guidelines, so you, you get a few functions that can set up the graph, it can run the graph, it can change the input images on the graph. So you, you just, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Very good question, though. Okay. <laughs> Can the tool do the other way around? I give you the C, the C code, give me the graph. Um, not from no. not as of today. <laughs> no, I mean you, you could you could do that. It's a it it's a one to one correspondence because it's just two ways of writing the same thing. So uh, you could write you could write that part. It would be helpful uh, uh, if you if someone else applies me. Yeah. Um, the code, right, and uh, yeah, would be, would be very helpful to visualize uh, yeah. the graph by just using the reverse tool. So y you should remember one thing: this this uh, generator generates code according to a certain scheme, and I will get to that because this scheme is made for something we call the graph manager that we wrote in C. That is, uh, it expects a few functions. It expects a setup function, a, a run function, and a change input image function. So that you, those are the things you typically do with a graph. So uh, the, it, the code is generated to produce those three functions. So, but if you have 
uh, code that conforms to that and you would want to go back to the actual graph, that would be doable. The thing is that uh, what we had, it was originally never intended for anyone else than us to use it. <laughs> so, and uh, Well, now you know the, yeah. the so, request. So, so it's a, it's an in, it was an internal tool, but then we kind of saw the need in the community for this and we want to promote this to make it easier to get started with OpenVX and to be more efficient. So uh, we thought as a starting point now we are open sourcing this tool as it is, but uh, we might want to put development into refining it further and we're inviting others to, to uh, help working on it as a community project. So we're hoping that we could end up with something better together. But uh, as a good starting point, this is what we have now. It or it's already useful for, for what it is. And uh, yeah. Um, one, another thing, <laughs> the, the, the previous graph you saw wasn't the biggest one. This is the biggest one we used. It has something like 155 nodes, I think. Uh, and uh, it's huge. It's also this kind of binary thing. We, we have been promoting the, the binary format because we do a lot of binary processing, morphing and those kind of things. Uh, so, uh, and, but the thing with this graph is it's also very rep repetitive. So you can see those kind of boxes throughout the graph here. So it's built up of a, a set, a subset of uh, individual subgraphs. So we introduced this subgraph concept and then the idea of chaining them together automatically. And then uh, that helped a lot to, to create those big graphs because that's, here's on a completely different level. You're not writing C code anymore, but even on this level to get everything right is tedious. So you can automatize that. That part is not currently in the uh, in the code that we're open sourcing because we need we need to do it in steps and we just did it last week so <laughs> it's a very fresh code so uh, but we're going to add to the code in the near future now I'm going to hand over to Mikael who's yeah. going to talk more about the yeah graph Hi. manager you hear me now yeah I'll just uh, talk a little bit about how we how we work with these graphs that we uh, sort of practically in using our C library so uh, sort of illustrating the workflow of how you would use OpenVX practically. I'm not, I'm not sure how many here are like application developers <coughs> using OpenVX or planning to use this. Okay, no. And the rest of you are implementing OpenVX implementation or you just want to use NNEF or? How, how many are doing like uh, hardware implementation, like doing the drivers and stuff? Like how many are? Okay, it's, it's a good mix of people. So, so we're coming from this, as Nicola said, from an application uh, <coughs> developer perspective. Uh, so we have this algorithm that we have drawn on the whiteboard or in the graph editing program and generated a bunch of code. And we want to get them into an OpenVX implementation, right? So we want to have them accelerated. So we have this uh, library in the middle called the graph manager. It's responsible for registri registering the graphs, just using this uh, code that we saw and just creating, sending them into the OpenVX runtime and where it can do all these uh, clever optimizations, like uh, it needs to do allocations and uh, merge together kernels and stuff like that. Uh, this other step that Nicholas showed, we have these subgraphs that we can connect together. <coughs> uh, our graph manager is also responsible for connecting those, chaining them together, create a larger graph. And of course, we want to process the graph. So this is what you want to do in your, uh, your processing loop. You have a video, enter it frame by frame, select a graph, because we have multiple graphs in our use cases. This can, this can vary a lot. I mean, if you have one neural network, it could be one single graph, but it also could be as a good question as you, uh, you said you could uh, chain up the graph into, because maybe it needs to run on specialized hardware. I mean, some part of the graph is better to do like that and use the pipeline extension probably. And you probably want some sort of layer to schedule this. And, and this is what our structure. So, yeah, the so, so the graphs are typically uh, pre-compiled then when we load them into the graph manager. So you can switch between them quickly. You don't need to re-verify them all the time. Yeah, exactly. So the registration step is basically you do it once. You do like uh, the VX verify graph is the call where you actually sort of tell the runtime to, to create all the objects and verify that everything is correct. Uh, so we process the graphs and we also want to update new, send new image buffers to the graph. Uh, yeah, the, the something is called the swap image handle in, uh, in OpenVX language, sort of. And the swap image handle means that you can swap, swap the picture, the input image, without having to re-verify the graph. Yeah. <coughs> so that leads us, uh, after having drawn, drawn the graph 
in this tool and uh, writing the graph manager library, while that's in place, this is basically, you don't need that many lines of code. So higher abstraction uh, the layers, I mean, it's, it's nice for, uh, for rapid application development. You can try out new, new algorithms faster. So we only need to set up this graph manager, register the graphs, and uh, choose which graph to process and swap input and output images. So this is what it looks like. Uh, part of this graph that we showed earlier for our uh, spatial temporal edge image generation, ready for the parser to handle. So we have drawn up these uh, virtual images. You can see here some. Oh, yeah. <coughs> I have like a, a uniform image. A uniform image here. We have these uh, function nodes, and we've drawn together how how it looks like. So, sort of to so so we can make sure for ourselves. We can convince ourselves that we have uh, that. Our code is doing what we want it to do. Virtual image basically means that we, ju we just know that we need an output image there as input for the next step, but we don't want to put any requirements on it. So uh, it, it's OK for, for OpenVX to sort of even uh, optimize that away and fuse kernels and so on. So it gives a lot of freedom to the, to the runtime compiler. Yeah, <coughs> exactly. So one thing that we, we found when, when uh, before writing this tool, when you sort of different OpenVX implementations have different uh, <coughs> levels of debugging. I mean, some are very easy to debug, some are very hard. I mean, it's very cryptic to see where in a big graph something was, was wrong. So catching these errors at an early stage uh, really helped us in development time. So, so when we run our parser, we have something we call a validation or an error graph. If something is not quite correct, we can sort of get a visual cue. We see that, OK, we mislabeled some edges here, or we spelled something wrong or something. We can fix this, and we can run the parser again, and we see that everything is green. And then it can sort of uh, figure out the uh, so S16 and U8, some of these image formats of the virtual images. So this, this might not be explicitly specified, but they can be sort of implicitly derived from the OpenVX specification. So this, uh, this error parsing uh, is all relying on the fact that the standard is very well spe specified. And so it, it <coughs> we're checking that the rules, uh, as they're stated in the standard, are implemented in the right way. So going through that and the requirements of number of labels, the requirements of image formats, are, are they all correct and so on. Yeah. And I mean, we're, we're, <coughs> we're doing this, and I, it's, I think it's a very good idea. You should be able to go backwards, uh, as you suggested. I mean, just put an issue on the GitHub and we'll <laughs> see if someone, it's an in, interesting idea. I think the hardest part would be to get, actually get the like, proper layout, but I mean, TensorBoard and everything has good features for that, so it should be doable. So, yes. That's a good question. How do we manage conditional flow? Uh, today, there's, there, there are some APIs in OpenVX, like VX, VX select node and stuff like that. This is something that differs a lot from our, our previous like hand-coded optimized version, which has a lot of conditional code. I mean, it's, it's not very <coughs> maintainable or readable, but it's, it's very, I mean, it's not, not that many lines of code actually in the end, but it's, it's very hard to understand. Well, and debug is impossible. But, uh, we are sort of doing conditional at the selecting different graph levels. So mm -hmm. that's sort of we have some, not these subgraphs, but we can select different subgraphs. That's one way we do. We create many graphs and we select which graphs to execute. Mm -hmm. That sort of answers your. So you, you let your graph managers negotiate conditions or they import subgraphs as needed, or what? Yeah, that's 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 the idea. What we have ended up doing is actually we preload all the graphs that we might that we c could potentially use, but that we could do it like that, sort of, uh, I don't know, some sort of just-in-time preload or load <coughs> of the graphs, but uh, just to ensure that we don't run out of the actual <coughs> special ed hardware resources, we, we want to preload them all, verify them before we actually run, before we start our application. It's, we have a security camera use case, so it needs to be constantly running, and so, so that's why we do it like that, but you could do it like that. One thing about this, <coughs> the general support of this uh, parser as well is that uh, since it started as an internal tool, we don't, we don't have a complete uh, OpenVX support of all nodes today. We have a subset, which is fairly large, but it's not complete. But the whole point of this uh, parser and the auto-generation tool is that it should be easily extendable when new nodes arrive. So we have a, a way to register and specify which rules they follow according to the standard. In a, so you just need a small file that says this, this is what the, the, the new node looks like. And then you register it in another file, you're, you're good to go. You have a new node. Right now, it's 
one ca caveat is that we have only tried with the image uh, nodes that produce image output. There are a few nodes that can produce other types of output, so that would require a small extension to the to the tool. To I, I don't think it's a, that hard to do. It's just that we haven't done it yet. So, so yeah, it's, it's a work image. in progress, but it's a uh, yeah. Yeah, it's for it's like the tool. image processing feature subset, you can say, it's sort of what we have used it for for now, but it's extensible. extendable. But the, the conditional flow thing is something that we've discussed it a lot in the working group, and it's, so mm -hmm. it would be really good to get like community feedback on mm -hmm. what people think are, is needed for the standard. <coughs> it's a very good question. Yeah. So this, I mean, what we actually ended up using and uh, our results, as Frank sort of showed yesterday as well, uh, execution time, of course, is very important. That's why we create these custom proprietary accelerators, and uh, we want to be able to use them with an API. But before, as we said, we had this uh, custom assembly implementation, right? So we have a CPU implementation, which, which we've had, because yeah. it's very very portable, but it's not that mm -hmm. fast. Um, I, I think this is wor worth to really stress. So during the development of the algorithm, those uh, OpenVX was still in the early stage of development. We started to, to do a, an assembly uh, implementation, which was incredibly hard to do. And that was also to uh, use to, to verify uh, our own hardware and things like that. So, uh, I mean, normally you don't do this complicated algorithm directly in, in assembly. So, but here we have a testing point to compare uh, the processing time in a pure assembly implementation versus high level APIs to see that uh, we can get higher level APIs without getting a significant drop of, uh, of performance, which is very, one of the key points of OpenVX that we should have performance left while making things easier. Sorry for the stepping yeah. in, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think no, it's, that's good. Yeah. It's a good, good point. So, so yeah, so, so the assembler <coughs> version, of course, or, uh, not of course, but it is the <laughs> fastest in this case uh, for this algorithm that we benchmarked here. But then our OpenVX implementation, which uh, we have developed in-house in as well, but not, not us ourselves, so we're just thankful for all OpenVX implementations, which we can use to get this performance. So th this is significantly faster than our CPU implementation, but the important thing that we want to talk about today is like the development time. So custom assembly implementation, it takes a long time, right? <coughs> it's hard to debug. OpenVX is it's a lot easier, but we actually didn't do this uh, using the C API. Because we can expect it's just we, we have a we have our own uh, C library which we would normally use our legacy computer vision library <coughs> is switching to another OpenVX C library that would take roughly the same time but we <coughs> because of what we showed with all these big graphs we didn't actually do that what we did so it's a question marker we don't really know how much that takes <laughs> so we did this graphical VX thing and that uh, actually shaved off a lot of development time and this enabled us to port more algorithms to our custom hardware so we. So, so these numbers are for one of the algorithms where we have an assembly implementation, but uh, using OpenVX enabled us to port other parts of the algorithm that we hadn't, we didn't just have the resources to do that for hand assembly. Right, so, so, so the assembly implementation is actually part of the entire <coughs> algorithm. We didn't do the whole thing. We, we did parts of it, and that's what we have be compared. And the, uh, an important point is ob obviously that the assembly code is not portable to other platforms, whereas the OpenVX code is. So that's, I think, what we had for, for the presentation. We're going to show you a little demo of this graph parsing tool, which is on GitHub. Uh, so yeah, here's the address. This will be in the slides. So I'm going to show you. So, so show it's, you it's there right now, if you want to check it out. What's there is right now exactly what we're demoing in the, in the demo. And we will add, add the graph manager in the near future. It just needs some cleaning up of the code, but it will be there too. But, but do we have any questions first on this in general? Or? Okay, so we'll show you a small example of how, how we draw these graphs. Yeah. <coughs> so, uh, yeah, we had uh, we have uh, we have an input image we want to analyze. All right. <coughs> we actually have two beautiful input images. Yeah. One dromedary air. <laughs> and then we have the other input image. Yeah. This is the other one. If that's the other one. Yeah. It looks very much the same. Yeah. So, uh, so can we tell, tell the okay, difference? So, so, yeah, it, it, the file name is different, so it's not the same. So the question is, are these images the same or not? And that we're going to use OpenVX to figure that out by building a graph in the graph editor uh, live now. Let's okay. see if we can get it to work. So we need, need a few nodes. This is our 
temporary node library. We're going to exp expand on this, but we prepared this for the demo. So uh, we need two input images, obviously. We need something we call the user data. That is a special node used just in the editor where we want to specify global parameters like input image width and, and uh, height, for instance. So it's just yeah. a technical thing for the editor to, to generate the code, right? And then uh, output image you have picked, yeah? And then we yeah. need a, a subtract node, so you yeah. that too. Good. So, yeah, let's just so we just move them over to an empty canvas and use them as building blocks. You can zoom a bit maybe so we can see. And you just drag the arrows and it will connect and create the right uh, XML in the background. Oops, sorry about that. Or graph ML actually is the format for, for YED, which is the tool we're using. And you need to, according to the standard, uh, the inputs are not equivalent, so you need to uh, specify which one is which, so we're just labeling them. That will also go into the XML uh, file for the parser to use. So yeah, let's just save just, this graph. Yeah. So this is the first attempt to do the difference. And uh, now, what are you doing now? You're compiling? Yeah. No, you run the graph first, the, the parse graph. Yeah. So that we can see. Uh, so this yeah, graph. Sorry, we're going to zoom in yeah. a little bit. Is this <laughs> the parser sorry. puts out, now we use the verbose mode, so it will put out a lot of information about what it did. We don't need that right now, but if you're debugging, it's useful. But it says success at the end, so that's good. And then we can, <laughs> <laughs> then we can look at, it, it generates a new graph, which we call the verification, yeah. a validation graph. And that one will, uh, if we open it yeah. in the editor, we will see that, OK, if everything is OK, it ha all the image nodes will be green. And we don't have any error, uh, red error uh, uh, nodes or anything. So, and we can see also it checked the formats. Obviously, this time we had specified the input and output format, so it just verifies that it works. It doesn't change anything or add yeah. any formats. But it should be runnable, so yeah. now we can compile it. And we'll just add the li linking to the OpenVX implementation. It's a sample implementation that we're using that is available on the Kronos uh, web page. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. And, we, and it produced another output file, so we can take a look at that. Diff demo one output zero. Let's see here. It's not that one. <laughs> it's not here, sorry. <laughs> there. Oh, there it is. It's pretty dark. Yeah. yeah. Need to enhance this somehow, right? Yeah, if there's a difference, we need to enhance it. So let's um, go back to the graph in the okay. editor. And uh, how can we enhance? Let's go to the uh, node library. So uh, we have a magnitude node. That one can uh, multiply. Oh, sorry, multiply. multiply, sorry, node. multiply. That one can multiply together two nodes and uh, b index by index in the image, it will multiply the values. And uh, we take a yeah. uniform image. That's a special image that you can specify. It will have the same value throughout the image. And uh, right now we're just working with black and white images. You can use color yeah. images, obviously. Um, and we'll have a virtual image, I think, for chaining them together. Yeah. So we'll some just more get this in here. And, uh, yeah. Oops. Oh. <laughs> what? what OK, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Just we didn't develop yeah. the front end, right? We just used the existing <laughs> rough tool. So the uniform image uh, is another, a third input, so to say, to the whole graph. So we'll just take the output here to be a virtual image instead, and then we'll link this together to a multiply node. We'll add this. And since we have two, two inputs to the multiply, now again we need to have a, we need to label them, obviously. Actually, multiply is commutative, so in some sense we don't need, but uh, we just doing it anyway for any, any time you have two inputs yeah. to be so consistent. Save this and we'll try to parse it again. Yeah. Sorry. There is the diff demo one. Oh. OK. 
Okay. Oh, no, it failed. So now we have got a failure. So then uh, let's go to the validation graph and figure out what went wrong. We have a red node there, and it says uh, output for image format U8 error. And that why is that? Well, oh, because the subtract node outputs S16, a signed uh, image, and uh, uh, multiplied and wants to have a, a signed 16 as output as well. Otherwise, it's not consistent. So uh, it's good. We caught the error. And uh, this means you, you can sort of rely on the graph tool to help you point out. You can, you can just try things out. And if it doesn't work, you will figure out why, why usually. So, we'll so we, need to, we need to actually enforce it. Because this, the subtract node it can supports uh, several output formats. But it does one as, as default to S16. So we need to tell it to be U8 in this case. And we do that by going to the properties, the data uh, fold, uh, fleek, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the data specify. option for the node, and specify that, and you specify it for the uniform as well, right? Yeah, because I so think it's another, now this should be yeah. U8 explicitly. And then we reparse it, and now we get, success. we get success. We can go in and look at it again to get the visual cue that everything yeah. is green, and you can see it has <coughs> the right formats everywhere. Yeah. Now we should be able to compile it again, and see what we get. <coughs> and oh. it's announced. Well, it's an Open <laughs> VX logo <laughs> hidden <Yay>. in the <laughs> dromedary. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's <laughs> Obviously, these are just cute toy examples, <laughs> but we actually use this tool for creating uh, much larger graphs. So we can yeah. I actually, to be honest, I used OpenVX to, to generate the overlay on the dromedar in the first place. <laughs> so, <laughs> because it turned out it, it was actually the easiest way. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Maybe we, can handy. maybe we can show this. Uh, so this is the yeah. actual uh, one of our graphs that we actually used in our application. We just want to show that it's actually possible to parse this one, too. It's not uh, made up or anything. <laughs> so. Uh, so for 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 this uh, for these small graphs that we showed here, maybe it's not as useful the tool, but it's still quite nice. It's a nice way to work with these graphs we feel because you usually just end up writing, yeah. drawing them anyway. So you might as well use that as your. You don't really need to think about pointers in the C code, so which is pretty nice. So, uh, so, here we, so we got a whole bunch of nodes now. It's a much longer p uh, parsing, but and you can see, yeah, it still got a success. Yeah. <coughs> and we can. Or should we go into go into the verification the code? Graph. We can see what it's actually. We can start been. with the verification graph, so right. just to see that uh, indeed turns gr green everywhere. So that's mm. a sign that it's uh, healthy. Yeah, yeah, Code-wise, sort of yeah. So here's the setup code. First, we have a lot of images set up, and then we have all the connect lines yeah, to, to connect everything in the whole entire graph. And these take are a bunch of internal images. And this, I think it will take you many are, hours to do this by so, hand. So this, all of this code we're looking at right now is just generated automatically. Basically. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, so that's, uh, yeah, that's our tool. <laughs> Any questions? So what, what platform is it running uh, right now? Which platform? This, oh, yeah, that's a good, very good question. So this, this examples that I'm running here, I'm just running on uh, on my laptop using the OpenVX 1.2 sample implementation. So the sample implementation is available at the the Kronos OpenVX registry, which is, I mean, really good for prototyping. I mean, so the sample implementation is not fast, but it's a, it, it's a well. It's not a reference implementation, so you, you can't use it to guarantee anything. But it's a, you, you can expect it to be right, and you can expect it to, if you want to try things out, you can expect to, to see. You can test if your algorithm is going to work or not, and uh, use it as a prototyping thing to see if it makes sense. And to learn about OpenVX and so on is a very good tool. But then, uh, yeah, for, for instance, in the Raspberry Pi will have, have an optimized implementation. So if you actually want to run things with performance, you would go to that instead. So right now it's running on your uh, on GPU on your laptop, right? No, CPU. Uh, this one oh, just is CPU? just running on yeah. CPU. But this one, we've, we've only used this for algorithm verification purposes. Yeah. I mean, and debugging them and seeing, OK, does a graph actually do what we want it to do? Sort of write unit tests for our algorithm. 
So, so you, can, you can run the whole thing on the, C, on the PC and entirely CPU and you connect the, the, the sample implementation and you have your real algorithm. It will run a little bit slowly, but you can test the whole algorithm uh, from end to end, which we have been doing a lot uh, during the prototyping and the design of the algorithms. But then in, in the end, of course, you want to put it on target uh, with some kind of optimized acceleration. That's where and the real benefit is. How would you do is. that? So now, okay, so yeah. you have it running on CPU, you're happy, graph is fine. Perfect. How do you, uh, yeah. Very good question. So this one, this, this is the OpenVX code, right? So, so this is uh, what's compiled using the OpenVX library. So, so if I link with this library, which, which is the sample implementation built for my PC, then it will run like this on the CPU and be very memory inefficient, but it will, I mean, work. I mean, it's a reference implement or sample implementation. But uh, so I just compiled the same source code uh, against our own OpenVX implementation. I just link with another OpenVX library, which will uh, then know what my device is. Uh, so, so device. So Can you show real quick uh, a make up? So, just, so, so uh, basically you compile yeah. to the target of, of your choice. That's, that's the thing. It's a good thing we can show you. Yes. So yeah, this is, this is just the little make file I used for this demo. So if I can see. So um, basically here I have the uh, OpenVX installation there. This is sample implementation, which I just installed in debug mode for x64. So yeah, just swapping this one out and using a cross compiler if you want to compile for another for another tool chain. Yeah. Does that answer your question? And how does it load to the target then? I mean, uh, the the code. The code, obviously, the code is the same because the APIs are the same. So, but you, you, will, you will compile a binary for that target, and then you will upload it and run it whatever way you usually run things on your target of choice, target platform of, cho of choice. Okay, it's C so code. When, when you run the code, it will automatically, because you, com you, com you linked it with the library VX, uh, OpenVX library specific to that platform. Exactly. exactly. It yeah. will figure out that it needs to load Go to uh, to whatever GPU the OpenVX. Yeah. Yes, is. so that's that's up to your to whatever OpenVX implementation you're yeah. you're so either developing yourself or you're buying it from somewhere. Or and some you're SDK saying it works on Raspberry Pi right now? Uh, that's what the, uh, in September I think it's oh, this, this is planned uh, <laughs> version. That the, but I mean the sample. Okay, maybe it runs out of memory, but the sample implementation <laughs> should be able to cross compile it for on the Raspberry. But I'm not sure if anyone has actually tried that. You you don't want to <laughs> do it for performance reasons, but you you could try it. So you're saying this uh, uh, sample demo uh, is going to be available for us to uh, to try it out on our own? This is this is available right now on GitHub. Yes, yeah. this way you can What's draw the URL to, to that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So go back to slides. <laughs> okay. Yep. PowerPoint and Linux is uh, <laughs> not a good match. So yeah, this is the. But this, these slides will all be like tonight on. <coughs> sorry. On the, on the Kronos website and registry, but yeah. Awesome. And uh, like I said before, uh, the graph manager will be there soon. So uh, this is, uh, you, you run it uh, in, a, in, a, in the demo setting way right now. So uh, the, yeah, it, it's a slightly limited, but it's, uh, it's uh, complete enough to do testing and to experience the graph parser already. And with the graph manager, it will be more general and you can do the full run loop, uh, loop the way we described it in the presentation. I think, any other questions? No? Then I don't know, I guess it's lunch now, and then we'll be back at one, or, yeah, yeah. great.